So, hello everybody. We need to stay here because I can move away from uh, uh, my device here. So, the first presentation is uh, about one of the use cases that uh, you has mentioned. Notification brokers, in fact. Uh, it's probably, you will not find exactly the same naming on the end of the document, but that's what we uh, will talk about today. So, uh, the idea actually started, personally speaking, in open air. I happened to be the technical manager of open air. And we had uh, an issue there uh, with redistributing content that we were collecting from repositories. And we thought of building uh, brokerage services that would deliver this uh, functionality. Then once we looked around, we had realized that several other people were working on the same topic or had similar issues. And so we decided to go on together. Um, that's the case for JISC, in fact. Then finally, we found a more uh, focused and actually uh, more uh, only comprehensive uh, uh, group in uh, the next generation repositories, where we think this can be just one of the pillars we, that we should all build on. Um, so let me start with the first uh, slide, just to uh, share a little bit of common language. Um, we are thinking of repositories as places today, at least, where we store scholarly resources, let's call them like this. We, sh we already know, we already work go well beyond the uh, PDF. Uh, repositories are now moving on uh, in order to store much more than that and be uh, the place where you can deposit resource data in cases of software, as it happens in my institution and so on. And it has to do with um, at least the basic functionalities that you can see there, from curation, preservation, findability, and access, right? This is very important. And of course, curation has to do with high quality metadata files. Then, if you look at uh, repositories from a more specific perspective, like one of the institutional repositories and more thematic repositories, then you can see slight differences there, right? For example, in my institution, the institutional repository uh, is really used uh, in order to store history of production of my colleagues. So the resource community it serves is one of uh, my institution. Uh, and it's really used uh, for research assessment. So we are mandated to actually deposit things in there in order to be able to assess how my group did, how my institute did, and in, uh, in the context of the wider uh, Consiglio Nazionale della Ricerca, which is the uh, main organization. Uh, discovery there Place a, minor, uh, place a minor role, right? So the institutional repository is not exactly the place where you would go and search. It's actually the place where you go and find what you need once you access and, you, and once you discover it via scholarly communication services like Google Scholar or other services. If you look at the thematic repository perspective instead, it's slightly different. Uh, in the thematic repositories, which are certain a research community or at least a group of users with common intent, it, it, these are probably the places where you would go and search if you belong to a specific uh, uh, group of people working on the same topic, right? Uh, and actually, the, the word kind of <laughs> uh, attempts in the past to move institutional repositories towards centralized <laughs> solutions that are similar to the thematic repositories, which fortunately didn't take. So, uh, what's behind uh, its two kinds of repositories? It's always a repository manager which has issues, right? In order to provide uh, those who are above the repositories with uh, what is needed to achieve their objectives, mainly research assessment, research trends, uh, evaluation, also history, the repository managers need to keep their collections complete, for example. So they must make sure that if a, a, a researcher is somehow affiliated or refers to in a repository, all is uh, outcome, all its findings in terms of res scholarly resources should be deposited in the repository. And this is not a easy thing, right? Uh, because you forget it, or because you don't do it in a proper way, because your metadata properties, for example, are provided in a very minimal way, so they're not curated enough, and the curator, the librarians, don't have necessarily the expertise in to cover uh, what is missing in the metadata, and the files, for example, files may be missing. Uh, may, may be missing just because I'm depositing one of the possible versions. Or maybe because there are so many versions out there with my co-authors that I'm not aware of all this, and I just upload one of them. Right? So, 
So there's always a danger of incompleteness of the content of the projects. And there are several barriers to that. The famous single deposition issue uh, is uh, behind here. So how can we help repository managers at uh, overcoming these, uh, these uh, uh, barriers? Well, in a way it's not possible, unless you go and uh, knock on the head of the researcher and ask him, please, when you upload your data, do it in the proper way. Deposit the files, all possible versions, deposit all the data uh, exactly as they should be, done, as they should be otherwise you might find you. Or, uh, even more complicated, in two years' time, when you will find a new version, or you will link your article to new data sets, you have to go back to the repositories and add the links to the data when these are missing. This is never going to happen, of course. We know that the position in a repository most of the time, 99.99% of the time, is a one action that takes place in time, time t, and then nothing's going to happen after that. Even if you pack the researchers to fix some issues, in some cases, it's not possible. So the idea is uh, very simple. Since we have so many resources out there, right? Let me see if this works. Oh, it's a shame. Oh, yes, it is. For example, uh, you have publishers, you have repositories out there, you also have data centers, which are keeping a lot of information, like metadata, for example, but also links, and also files, actually payloads, right? And at bottom, you have uh, the repositories. So the idea of corporate services is the following, is to uh, offer the possibility to repositories to subscribe, which literally means uh, I want to know uh, if something happens that relates to me and to my content. And uh, we, uh, and the corporate services are offering tools for those services on top to publish events, to say, hey, this thing has happened on my site. I put it there. So if a repository is interested to know, this goes there, right? So this is a very simple principle that lies behind the idea of broker, of broker and services in computer science. Uh, you, you're probably using them without knowing that you're using them, right? Uh, for example, in Facebook, in Twitter, this is what happens all the time. You're being notified of something that is of interest to you, as long as this event takes place. Uh, use cases, for example, internal repository, this is a very interesting use case. You have an open access repository on the left and uh, one on the right, which is an institutional repository. This happens to be the place where Mr. Rossi deposits his uh, research papers because it belongs to the uh, researcher's institution, right? And then you have another repository, which is an open access repository that stores, again, uh, papers and metadata together. Now, what happens here is that you have the same paper being deposited into different repositories. But this version here is the one from uh, the elephant. That's a beer, right? Uh, well, this one here is, uh, is a preprint. The same, another, another interesting scenario is the one where you have two publications here, which is from Mr. Rossi, right? It's been deposited there, but it's not available here. Okay, so. Here is one of those uh, situations where we would like to see this information moving from one repository to the other in order to complete the second collection with what is missing out there. Um, another example, well, yeah, this is just a list of things that may be uh, of interest to uh, intra uh, uh, notification between repositories, intra repository notifications. So, uh, open access is one case, we can pass you the open access version, you can pass me the non open access one, but there's full of things that we can do, starting from links, for example, links to other objects, which is uh, one of the mm, key, actually, uh, steps toward open science. Data centers are another nice example. You can extend it to research infrastructure services in general. Whenever uh, um, authors, researchers, create scholarly objects, be them data sets or files or whatever, that bear a link to a paper, for example, you may want to deliver this link to the repositories who own that paper, so that the repository can complete the collection, and of course enhance its content and deliver better services again to its own community. Uh, for publishers, for publishers, this is another interesting scenario. Publishers are 
constantly publishing papers, right? They constantly, constantly uh, moving on on the web and on their uh, stores and, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, websites uh, papers of different kinds. For example, these are papers produced by uh, the authors George Ann, and Lucille. Uh, if you, you know, if you know that repositories out there have George and Lucia and Ann as potential uh, researchers interested to deposit there, then it may be, it may be reasonable to deliver this information to these repositories. So repositories have constantly kept up to date with the production of their own researchers, the one they're trying to serve. Okay, this is not a simple scenario that can be interested. There are several other use cases. Uh, one of them I just added it when we were talking with my colleagues. For example, you may have services up there who are delivering peer reviews and transparently giving peer reviews. You may want these services to notify that a new peer review for a paper has been deposited and send link to the original repositories that are interested in that. The same goes for annotation or social links. A severe and data site are working on a notification system for um, uh, the social aspects of science. So whenever a tweet, a tweet or a Facebook uh, account produces a comment on a paper mentioning a DOI, this is considered an event of interest that is sent to the original cross reference implementation. So you can share, you can have access constantly to uh, all comments generated for a given paper. So, uh, by taking a look in Outlook, uh, there we found at least three different approaches. I'm not saying that this complete uh, division, but these are just a start. So, real time brokering, which is the one you, you have in mind every day and you use every day, in fact, which is when a provider of events push something to the broker as long as it happens in that very moment. For example, uh, I'm publishing a paper, and or I'm, I'm actually saying, as a, as a scientist, I'm saying, I'm claiming that my paper is linked to a dataset, and I put it in my repository. Now, this information, as long as it is deposited, stored somewhere, is sent to all of those uh, consumers of the broker service that are interested in that. Best brokering is a completely different story. Best brokering is different because uh, it, it's, it has nothing to do with real timers. So basically, I'm trying to generate all events, event, again, we have to think of what is event here, that are of interest to uh, a repository. For example, a scholar could do it. A scholar could say, okay, I have a lot of information about uh, the papers, and I may send all information about one paper, uh, send it to the repositories that want to know about it. So this is not about something that is going on now, right? But it's about something that happened in the past and I'm interested in knowing about it anyway. So it has to happen in batch because I'm sending you everything I have, you do something with it and you give me back and you notify me whenever something new on your side concerning me, uh, uh, of course. Targeted brokers are more of the kind of the publisher that you've seen before. So basically, a targeted broker is a broker that has um, predefined profiles. So what is a consumer and what is a producer? So uh, if I'm participating as a consumer, for example, I will expect certain kind of notifications coming to me. Typically, this is one way. And it's very similar to the publisher uh, repository uh, scenario that we've seen before. If you're a publisher, you know that you have to uh, send your papers to the broker. You know that your author list will have to match the one of repositories, and repositories that are consumer know that we have to provide an author list and map it to the one of the publisher. So it's really a slot, right? So notification and subscription go beyond uh, the simple subscription notification protocol and requires some handshake between consumers and providers. Uh, there are several open challenges which are wor really worth discussing. Uh, the, 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 the first ones uh, have to do with the model. What is an event, in fact? Because we discussed it today. It's not just an event in the sense of a traditional broker, what we're discussing here. It's an event that has to do with scholarly communication. So we may decide what these kinds of events uh, uh, are, how can they be classified, so we can build, basically, 
implementation of subscription notification brokers that are aligned can interoperate, for example, across them. This has to do with the second point. So, for example, protocols for subscription and notification delegation. I am a broker and I provide you with a number of sub subscriptions you can play with. For example, you give me your DOI and I will tell you everything about this DOI. And I will tell you the tweets about, the, about this DOI. But then there's another broker who has different consumers who are subscribing to its own subscription who might be interested in mine. So these consumers should register to me and start again you know, the process of subscription uh, unless me as a broker I find a solution, I find an agreement and a protocol with the other broker in order to share the subscriptions. This leads us to a scenario where consumers, repositories in this case, can register to one broker right, and count uh, on the fact that we'll be able to access all possible subscriptions by registering only once. We will not, we'll not have to follow the different implementations of the different brokers in order to access to different kinds of material. So these are all open challenges we can discuss this very days. There's a lot of work that has already been done. The JISC, for example, has implemented the notification broker and uh, it implements exactly the scenario of the publishers that I've seen before, that I've shown before. So some publishers are subscribed as provider and send information as long as papers are uh, published and repositories are being notified accordingly. If a mapping between the author of uh, the paper can be found with respect to a given repository of reference. Uh, this can be done especially at the national level with strong slot again strong agreements because they have rigid list of authors. Of course it's a completely different story if you move it to scenarios where uh, author IDs are not available at all. The UBNA notification broker implements instead the batch broker uh, perspective. So basically we are in UBNA collecting a lot of material from thousands of repositories, data centers and other kinds of sources. So once we put it together, we run notification, so we put similar objects under the same representative objects. And in this case, we're able to make a distinction and say, uh, since I know who are who those repositories who are giving me the object, I can calculate the difference and calculate what is missing in that repository that I can collect from the object. So I leave this notification, potential notifications, up to the repositories to subscribe to, and if they want, they can collect this content. Uh, in OpenAir Connect, which is another project, we are working on delegation protocols uh, between the GISC and the OpenAir uh, broker and see what will happen there. Because these are two very two, two different, completely uh, different perspectives and not be hard, uh, so easy to put them together. How much time do I have? That's fine. It's more than what I need. So this is just the uh, prototype of the broker service in the open air. Let's see. Okay. So this is a little bit more. This is uh, the, the repository dashboard. Basically, this is the interface that is provided, will be provided to uh, repositories to access all functionalities provided by open air from registration management, validation, browse history of the system and so on. And plus we, uh, we have added uh, this enricher content. Basically repository managers can access to uh, th this guy, this repository manager here is managing six repositories. And these six repositories are being harvested in the um, This is one of the beta system, but some of the events have been generated in a way. So if you do here, doesn't work, you're the same. And you have access to this repository is called the Mertes. You have access to uh, all the notifications that we have generated for the repository. As you can see, these events are kind of uh, not what you would expect, let's say, because these are not events uh, of the data center generating a link of interest to the repository. These are events generated by an aggregator, which is 
trying to find what is of interest to the methods, right? And that can be found in other repositories. For example, we started classifying them in this way. Uh, these are, of, uh, first of all, these are now Richmond's. Can you see it? Um, let me see if I can do something to improve that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so these are enrichment events. We also have addition. Addition means that I'm sending you something you don't have. So it's a record that I suppose is of your repository, but I cannot see it in your repository. These are instead enrichment, which means I found information about your records but information that you're missing. We have two kinds of, um, two subclasses uh, of enrichment events, more and missing. More means that you already have this information, but I have one that is different, so you may want to have it anyway. In this case, is you already have an open access version, but I found more that may be interesting you, so if you want, I can send it to you. Missing instead means you really don't have it. You don't have a persistent identifier, but I found one for you. Let me, let me see if I can find it. Uh, subjects is the same word. Okay, so these are the records from the original repository. And together with the new PIDs that I found. Okay? For example, I found a PNC identifier for this uh, record. It's in the Greek repository. It comes from Europe. So this is a candidate notification. This means that I'm sending you something that is potentially interesting. So if you want, as a user, you can now set up a configure a subscription, saying now that I see that you have something that is of interest to me, please send it to me whenever I need it. At the system, we send an email with a link saying, okay, there's something new for you. This something new, of course, <laughs> has to be defined. In open air, we make a, we made a decision. Uh, the first time you run this system as a repository, we like to receive thousands of notifications. From that point on, you don't want to be notified of these thousands every time, right? So you just want to be notified about the extra that you've been added. So we have to keep an history of all the notifications that have been sent to you. And this is again another strategy, which is to be uh, included in the one that I mentioned before. So keeping an history of uh, notification has to do with these kind of challenges. Um, final note. Uh, trust is important. Trust is a key thing, especially in this kind of context, because repositories want to ensure that they have a high quality metadata, right? And some of the information that we can send via notification for a repository may be not as reliable. For example, because it's being produced by a machine, like by uh, inference, right? Or is being produced by a data source and containing data source whose trust is not very high. So whenever we generate an event and we send it out, we must find a way to encode a trust. We made it here zero to one. So if you scroll this bar, basically you're able to skim through the different level of trust. Uh, in this case, the level of trust is the one we have for the duplication algorithm which in some cases is very high because the match is almost sure. For example, if we find the same persistent identifier, that should, we shouldn't be that sure, but <laughs> we're that sure it is. Uh, in other cases, it's not. So we generate the level of trust that is a little bit lower. And the user is able to skim through this. Right? So in the overall ecosystem of broken services, this is another important aspect that should be included. And I'm done. If you have questions.